is Caroline Williams. Miss Caroline, did you pray and ask Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And if you die tonight, where will you spend eternity? Amen. Amen. Give her a hand. <laughs> Thank her for coming forward to baptism. And let me remind you, Miss Caroline, that baptism is the picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I baptize you, my little sister, Caroline Williams, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Give her another hand. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you today. Good to have guests with us today. Let me remind you come together. We do have those that are sick and afflicted. Also, Miss Bobby Spates went on to be with the Lord, and she's worshiping this day in heaven. So we want to pray for that family, and so please lift the Spates family up in your prayers. Let's stand and move around today, greet one another, and then we'll begin in worship in just a few
Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 through 17 says it this way as we've sing these songs I'll fly away victory in Jesus when the morning comes for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are still alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Not only is this the biblical foundation for a song such as I'll Fly Away, but it's the biblical foundation for the rapture, that one day God will rapture us up out of here. And if not, then the end will come. If we, one way or the other, if we make it through the rapture, to the rapture or not, the end will come. Now, I'm holding out for the rapture. I don't know about you. But I believe the Lord's coming back. If you do, say amen. amen. You may be seated this Lord's day as we come together. It's always an exciting day to start a service with baptism because baptism is the first step of discipleship. And we want to do salvation, discipleship, worship, evangelism, ministry, and fellowship well at Lifeline. And that means that we all need to work together. And as we do that, there are several things. If you make sure that you have your worship guide, I'm not going to go over those things now, but make sure that you're ready to help us with the Easter egg hunt coming up. 93.3, the fish is going to be partnering with us as well as the Little Rock School District, the Little Rock Police Department, and the Fire Department. They have all kinds of new things that they're actually going to be bringing that day, going to use them first of all here. And then also we're going to be partnering with some of our other business and community leaders. You say, well, why are we going to focus that much time and energy on an Easter egg hunt to share the gospel with children? There are multitudes of children right now all over the world that have either never heard Jesus or they're not living in the power of the gospel. On one way or the other, they're having difficulties. We live in a world today where we're facing difficulties. I'm going to ask our instrumentalists just to begin to play Pray, play, and we're going to move into a special time of prayer. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me, please, and close your eyes. Today, as we come together, we need to pray, not only for our city and our mayor as he leads us, our state and our governor as he leads us, and our country and our president as he leads us, but for our world. And in particular, Mr. Putin, the people of Russia and the people of the Ukraine. Even again last night, I had a call from a young man on his way from Italy to Berlin. He said, I'm just stressed out. I can't even begin to imagine. And I can't imagine how you would live in those days, in these days, in that place, in this world, without Jesus. I'm going to ask you today to pray for the people of the Ukraine people of Russia and Mr. Putin in particular and the president of the Ukraine that God would intervene and work in their lives as never before that God would lead us as a country that God would lead us as a state as a city even this week on Tuesday we'll have our business and community leaders luncheon we'll be meeting with these leaders on Tuesday we will pray together I'll share a verse of scripture we need to be the leaders that God's called us to be. You know if somebody today sick or afflicted, would you hold up a hand in their honor? Go ahead and hold, amen. Hands all over the place. 
going to ask you to pray with me today. If you need today to come to the altar in just a few moments, please do so. I'm going to ask our leaders, whether you're a deacon or a yoke fellow, you're a Sunday school teacher, you're on one of the 38 committees or ministry teams in this church, you're a member of this church, I'm going to ask you to join me in the altar right now as we pray for our world. Would you do that now this morning, please? Just get up right now and make your way to the altar and pray for our world. Pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia. And then we'll come back and voice our prayer. Thank you for coming today. If you're a leader in this church and you can, would you make your way to the altar of this church, bind our hearts in prayer, and ask God to move. Matthew 18, 19 says, If two ask in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. And let's ask today, in the name of Jesus, that He would work in our midst. Let's have a few moments of silent prayer. And then I'll close us in prayer. Lord God, in the power and the blood, in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, I pray that you'd help every Christian in this place to rise up and to be counted as one of your children. As we learned in Sunday school, that you'd consecrate us, sanctify us so that we can be used by you as salt and light. God, I pray for every New Testament church that's not only meeting in this city and state and country, but around the world today. And I pray that you'd bind our hearts together in prayer as never before. Just as we've seen little Caroline saved and baptized today, I pray that that would be our prayer. That you would save every boy and girl who has a heartbeat today. And that you would save their mothers and their daddies. That you would be with these men and women. As we see prophetic messianic pictures playing out in our world today. I pray that you would save before it's everlasting too late. And I pray Lord God in Jesus name. That you would be with us as a church. Even as we get ready for an Easter egg hunt. With so many hundreds and thousands of people. are Without their homes. Without livelihood today. And even in our own country. Lord God the prices are going so high that people are struggling to make it. God, let us be the church. Be with our mayor as he leads our city. Please be with our governor as he leads our state, our president as he leads our country. Be with world leaders. Everyone. God, we know that you're the answer. We pray that you would intervene in our world situations today. But we pray it in the mighty, bold name of Jesus. God's people said, going to ask you today to make sure that you have your Bibles open to Psalm 78. Today, as we've been reading through the Psalms, we're reading Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. The hitting of this Psalm says, oh, it, it says God's guidance of His people in the spite of their unfaithfulness. God's guidance of His people in spite of their unfaithfulness. A mascal of Asaph. We know that these mascals were for the worship directors, for the time of worship when people met publicly to worship. We meet publicly to worship today. And privately, I pray that you've been worshiping this week. Today, we're going to read Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. Would you rise in honor of the reading of the Word of God? Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord. That is a pre-incarnate picture of Christ, that word Lord, capital L-O-R-D. And his strength, his wondrous works that he has done. For he has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, 
that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God but keep His commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. I pray just as we've seen today a mother and a daddy able to lead their daughter to faith in Jesus Christ that you and I are leading the next generation because of the amazing grace of God. Brother Clay, you come and lead us, please, as we sing. My Savior, Redeemer, Lifted me from the mighty clay, Almighty, forever. I will never be the same, cause you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only From the miry clay, almighty forever, I will never be the same cause you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's own. Father's only son, cause you came near from the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only son. The only thing that we ask you to place in the offering plate is the guest information sheet that's right there before you. We teach our folks that when they're away from their home church, their tithe and offering belongs there. Today we want to know who you are so that we can better minister to you. We also teach our folks that this is a time to listen to God. So listen to the offertory. Our ushers wait to come in until after the offertory is through so that we can listen to God. And we want to hear him. Because of your giving, God continues to move in our midst. And just like last Sunday, when the 
biggest Sundays and tithing and offering that we've had at Lifeline in quite some time. Give the Lord a hand and thank God for that because God is moving. And we do not have to go out with our hands out because of your giving. We're able to be salt and light. Brother Tom, would you voice our prayer, please? Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, Father, we ask you today to be near to all those in the world situation, those who are displaced of the millions of Ukrainians who are seeking asylum or seeking uh, relief from what's going on in, in their home country. And Father, we ask that you be with our people in this country, Father, those who try to hold us to a, 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 a spot that we, we don't deserve. And Father, again, we lift up our leaders, Father, I pray for uh, each and every one that they'll make decisions that are based on the love of Christ. Now, as we go into the rest of the service, Father, be with Jeff as he brings the message this morning. Give us an open heart and mind to take your word and apply it to our lives. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Miss Linda. It's so good to have Miss Linda back on the instruments. Give the Lord a hand and thank God for that. It's good to have Terry back with us. We do have many that are sick and afflicted. Continue to pray for them. Today, Miss Sherry's out of town, but our children's folks are coming for the children's church. The, uh, and so we're so glad that they're, they're all here. Brother Adam's coming, those that are going to help him. All of those boys and girls that want to go to the Lifeline Landing, you line up here with Mr. Adam and give these folks a hand and thank them for being with us today. Miss Jennifer is going to come and lead us as we worship together. Yes, and as, as she is coming, hold on just one moment. Okay, Miss Caroline, I'm going to ask Emily and Josh Williams, would you come up here with Miss Caroline, please? We do have a presentation that we want to make, and I just about forgot that. Miss Misty that works with our family ministry is going to make that today. Miss Jennifer, would you give her that mic, please, real quick? And thank you so much, and then you can have it back. All right, good morning. Uh, Caroline, we are so proud of you and the decision that you've made. And so we have a certificate of baptism for you. And we also have a Bible and a book about now that I am a Christian. And you also have a story box that will you can put things in there to tell about your testimony and your uh, decision that you've made. Very good. Let's pray for the Williams family today and ask God to be with them. God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would be with Joshua and Emily. And God, I pray you'd be with Miss Caroline and all of her family members that are here today to praise and to celebrate because she's been saved and baptized. And I pray, Lord God, that you'd be with this family and let them live daily as an example of your love and your discipleship in their lives. Thank you for a mother and daddy that not only loves you and loves each other enough to love their child, to share the gospel with them. Thank you for these family members who are showing their love and their support for Caroline by being here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Miss Misty, Miss Caroline will take you to Sunday school or to the church and give this family another hand. Miss Jennifer is going to come and sing with them. Past the point of weary, is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. dreams and wasted years until the past to disappear oh let me tell you about my jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who could work it all for your good let me tell you about my jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Take my cross to Calvary. Pay the price. 
is for my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let my jesus change your life As we study God's Word together, make sure that you have your Bibles open to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, as we study God's Word together today. We're talking about the life of Jesus Christ, and we're looking at it according to Matthew, the life of Jesus Christ. That's important. You know about your life. You know about the life of the people that live with you. The other day, somebody asked me about names, and why I thought it was important to know somebody's name. If you know somebody and you take the time to know their name, then it shows them the love of God, the love that you have for them, and it may show them that you're at least going to pray for them. And so names are important, lives are important, your life matters to God. Our lives matter to God. And today we look at the life of Jesus Christ. Now today we're looking at this from the perspective of Matthew, the first writer that we have in this order in the Gospels. Many folks realize that he's probably not the first of the disciples or the men to write about Christ. Most believers today believe that Mark's Gospel was probably the one that predated Matthew and Luke and that in fact Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark's Gospel and then the Apostle John wrote sometime. And so you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke giving us a synopsis of the life of Christ. And you have the Apostle John, also a cousin to Jesus Christ, if not a very first cousin, who gives us the theology of Jesus Christ. And so let's go over the outline of Jesus' life from St. Matthew's Gospel perspective. Number one, Jesus was born, Matthew 1, 1 through 2, 15. Number two, just like Caroline today, Jesus was baptized, Matthew 3, 1 through 17. Just like me and you and all other human beings, Jesus is tempted, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And Jesus preaches. He is the prince of preachers. He is the prophet of prophets, the apostle of the apostles. And he is God's son, the only begotten, born of God. And so he preaches, Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Jesus goes fishing for men, Matthew 4, 18 through 25. Let me remind you, as Jesus goes fishing for men, two of his early disciples, probably disciples of John the Baptist, but notice that there's no jealousy between John the Baptist and Jesus. Noticing that Jesus understands and he teaches and he preaches, and he baptizes. John the Baptist has no jealousy of Jesus. Also a cousin to Jesus and the apostle John, but John the Baptist has no jealousy for Jesus. And that's unlike the world that we live in today. Even among preachers, from time to time, there can be jealousy. Among brothers and sisters in the church, there can be jealousy. Among churches, there can be jealousy. We're not here to compete with each other, not even as a church. There are enough lost people in Pulaski and Saline counties and the counties around us that we could fill every church house with the steeple on top and those without until Jesus comes again and we would still have room left over and there would still be multiple lost people 
There should be no jealousy. And between John the Baptist and Jesus, there's no jealousy. Even when Jesus takes uh, Peter and Andrew, two of John the Baptist's disciples, and he takes them, they follow him, and they become his disciples. Please notice that there's no jealousy. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is next in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 1 through chapter 7, verse 28. Today and in the days ahead, we're not going to get through with the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to try to walk through it. You can see on the screen, and if you have not written down, take the time to understand Jesus' life should be an example for my life. Birth and salvation, baptism, temptations, fishing for men, and life according to the Sermon on the Mount. As you listen to the Sermon on the Mount today, ask yourself, am I living according to the Sermon on the Mount? Lifeline's March 2022 theme is, uh, be strong and courageous, no failing, no forsaking. God has promised, if you belong to Him, that He is never going to fail you, He's never going to, fa- uh, to forsake you, He's never going to leave you alone. I'm dealing with a young man that's become a close friend, and he is right now in a rehab center, and he's realized that because of his actions, his sins against God, and thusly against his wife and his children, that he may lose everything that he has. But he realizes that he is a Christian. And so... I had to remind him, you're never going to lose Christ. He's promised that he will never fail you, and he will never forsake you. But you have to ask yourself this question. If God thought you were a Job, and God allowed Satan to take everything away from you, would God be enough? Would God be enough? If you were to lose your wife or your husband, God forbid, or you were to lose your children or your grandchildren, or you were to lose somebody very close to you, you were to lose your livelihood, all the finances that you had, all the food, you had nothing left, would God be enough? And friend, we need to learn that for the Christian, God must be enough. God and God alone, and He's promised never to fail you, nor to forsake you. But that is an important question. Now remember that God tests for the positive, Satan tempts for the negative, and God's people endure in the power of the resurrection. Listen to me again. God tests for the positive. Yes, indeed, God will test you. Satan can't touch you without God's permission. He had to have God's permission to go after Job. Satan didn't even know who the betrayer was going to be among the disciples at the Lord's Supper until Jesus identified him. We give Satan way too much credit. But let me remind you today that God tests for the positive, Satan tempts for the negative, and God's people endure in the power of the resurrection. Now as we think about these things, we're reminded of Joshua 1, 5, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. I will not fail you or forsake you. There are two people that I've been afraid of in my life. God being the first, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triunity of God, and my mother, the second, even at my mother's death. Barely five foot, weighed less than a hundred pounds, they're around, I did not disobey her. If she told me to do something, I would do it. Why? Because I loved her. And I always felt safe when she and my dad were around. Now, she was a little woman, and she didn't know how to use a weapon to the best of her ability. She didn't know how to use a weapon. The only weapon that she could have used was an iron skillet, and she threatened to use it on me from time to time. But she kept a belt, but she didn't have to use it after I was 14 because I trusted God with her, and I knew that my mother meant business. How many people that you've met, and you know they mean business? Go ahead and hold up your hand. You've got somebody in your mind. Friend, God means business. Say that with me in your head. God means business. And so today we think about March 22, Sunday focuses, Sunday, March 6, prayer, 
Today is Bible study, and it's how fitting it is that it's Bible study. Notice the verses, the songs that we've sang to lead us up to this message. And then next Sunday will be discipleship and evangelism. Notice today, as we think about Jesus' on March focus, Jesus teaches the church how to pray, teaches the church how to do Bible study, and he teaches the church how to disciple, and he teaches the church how to evangelize. The problem is, is we do not follow the instructions. In all of these church years, we try to come up with programs instead of doing exactly what God wants us to do. And notice that many of our programs have failed. And some of our programs have become forsaken. But God never fails us, and God will never forsake us. And we do not want to be about a program. We want to be about people. Somebody asked me the other day, well, how many buildings have you built since you've been in ministry? I can say to you that I've never been a part of a building campaign. We've never had to raise money to build buildings. But because of people like you and churches like this one, we build people. And as we're building people, those people will be built to build others. And maybe they need a building, maybe they do not. But we need to be building up God's people. And so are you applying the Sermon on the Mount? Attitude and reward is what we're going to be looking at today. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Please rise in honor of the reading of the Word of God. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. We will read again verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Pray with me, please. God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd speak to me, and I pray that you'd speak through me. And God, I pray that you'd help us to understand what you teach us about your attitude and apply your attitude to our own lives. And God, I thank you ahead of time for the way that you reward our good attitude. God, you never reward bad attitude, but you do reward good attitude, and you use the word reward in your scriptures. So help us to understand that and to make application today. For we pray in the name of Jesus, God's people said. This morning as you're seated, last week we talked about Jesus on attitude, Matthew 1, 1 through, excuse me, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Today we're going to look at Jesus' attitude, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, and also Jesus' attitude rewards, Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Now as you think about these things, let me remind you that we talked about Jesus on attitude. He saw the crowds, he taught the disciples, and he was a blessing to the people around you. Are you a blessing? I heard many people, and we had a really good group to attend our Wednesday night supper and our Wednesday night Bible study, and this week we're going to have another great meal. You need to be with us on, on Wednesday nights. We're going through the Bible from Genesis, and we're in 1 Corinthians. We've gone from Genesis to 1 Corinthians, back through the Bible, learning to study God's Word. That's one of the biggest things that I hear why people do not study God's Word is because they will say they do not know how. And so we do not want you to have an excuse. We want you to know how to study God's Word. But when we think about this question, am I a blessing to the people around me or would they see me as a curse? Am I a blessing to the people around me or would they see me as a curse? And the word blessed means long happiness. We get our word beatitude from it in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Every time you read the word blessed, We get our understanding of the Beatitudes from it, and it means long happiness. Now let's talk about Jesus' attitudes. They're tenfold. He has ten attitudes that he wants you and I to adopt and to apply to our lives. 
We're going to look at the attitudes, and then as time permits, we'll come back and we'll talk about the rewards of those attitudes and what it means. Number one attitude is to be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit, and this Greek New Testament word means ultimately to be a beggar. And notice this, a beggar of the spirit of. A beggar of the spirit of. I want the spirit, and I'm begging the spirit. Now, in this case, it's the Spirit of God. If you're not a believer, it's going to be the Spirit of the Antichrist, the Spirit of Satan, the Spirit of sin nature, the Spirit of sin that is within you. But I need to be a beggar of the Spirit. Now, remember in the Old Testament, if you follow the Old Testament, we're introduced to God the Father. And the Hebrew word for God the Father is El or Elah or Elom. And we get the word Ah or Allah from it. The Muslims do. And so please notice that we get many words El that arrive from God the Father. El, Elohim, El Shaddai. And so that's the Hebrew word for God the Father in the New Testament. Excuse me, in the Old Testament, uh, Genesis chapter 1. The next word for God the Spirit is Ruach. And then you have the word for God the Son, which is Yahweh. That's the word that we get, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D from. So we see the triunity of God in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. The word for God the Father in the New Testament is Theos. We get our word theology or the study of Theos. The study of God is the word for God the Father. God the Spirit is the word that we have pneumonia from. It's God the wind or God the breath. And then Jesus is the word God the Son. But please notice in the Old Testament we understand that there are people that were saved they had a faith that fast forwarded to the person of Christ just like our faith rewinds to the person of Christ but we see the triunity of God and in this age that we live, we live in the church age. And so please help me and let me help you to understand the Old Testament age, the New Testament age, the age in which the Old Testament was written, New Testament age, the age in which the New Testament was written, and now we're in the church age. And God is speaking, but it's not going to go into a canon. We have the Old Testament canon, the New Testament canon. No doubt God is speaking just like He spoke to the young lady that was saved. He spoke to her parents. He spoke to you. He's led you to church today. But please notice that we need to be poor in spirit, which means that I need to beg the Holy Spirit to do a work in my life. That's why we pray. That's why we hide God's Word in our heart that we won't sin against Him. That's why we come to church and we worship publicly and we worship privately. But when was the last time you were poor in spirit and you begged the Holy Spirit to do a work in your life? Somebody said, well, I'm only a beggar of the Spirit in a time of emergency or crisis. Well, we realize in a time of an emergency or crisis, we need the Holy Spirit, but we may not have so many emergencies or so many times of crises if we would be beggars of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of, and for me and for you, it is of God. Now, if you're here today and you do not know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, friend, let me say to you, whether you believe that there's a God or not, God is trying His best to get your attention. He's given you general revelation. You woke up this morning. You looked at the sun, the moon, and the stars. You could know that there's a God. You've heard specific revelation in the person and the name of Jesus Christ. That's why names are important. And today, we need to be a beggar of the Spirit of God. Because if you're not at the feet of the Spirit, then you're going to be at the feet of Satan, or you're going to be at the feet of sin nature, or you're going to be at the feet of sin. And let me say this to you, that's the difference between idolatry and worship of God. When you're worshiping God, you will not enter into idolatry. But if you're not worshiping God, if there's something that God took away, God allowed it to be taken away, and it would cause you to lose your faith in God, then God was not enough for you, and that's idolatry. And friend, idolatry causes us to look inward instead of looking outward. And we spend much of our time, too much of our time, looking inward instead of looking outward. And that's why we've entered into idolatry and not worship. So ask yourself this morning, am I poor in spirit? Attitude number two, am I mourning? Now notice as he says this in St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter, three, ble- it's chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then he says in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. Now what are we going to mourn? 
let me remind you that there would be no mourning if it weren't for death. And let me also further remind you that there would be no death if it weren't for Satan and his opportunity and ideology of I want God's job. I think I know more than God and I want God's job. In Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, write that down if you do not have it written down or memorized. Isaiah 14 12 reminds me that Satan, it's a picture of the king of Babylon, but the king of Babylon did not live eternally and so in, in past and in present he will live eternally in the future, but it's a picture of Satan. He wanted God's job and he's kicked out of heaven. And because of that, he introduces Adam and Eve to a sin nature that they did not have when God created them. And then they continued to sin because they disobeyed God. And immediately they had one son to murder the other. You cannot have death without mourning. You can't have death without mourning. And let me say to you today, this morning, what does God want me to mourn? God wants me to mourn death. And God wants me to mourn sin. And God wants me to mourn sin nature. And God wants me to mourn that there was an angel that thought that he knew more than God and he wanted God's job. Talk about idolatry. He looked inwardly instead of working, looking outwardly and he was in the portals of heaven. I'd rather be a human being than an angel because human beings get grace and we sing about about that grace today that angel only got one shot the moment that he decided to go against God God kicked him out of heaven friend I do not want to be kicked out of the things of God I want everything that God has to offer me don't you and as a whole people around the world today they want everything that God wants them to have they want everything that God has them to has to offer them but we've stopped mourning over sin Instead of mourning over sin and sin nature and the things of Satan, we celebrate it. We raise it up on the pinnacle. We will raise a flag to it. We will bow a knee to it. And friend, sin is sin and God will always punish sin. And sin is costly. It will rob you of everything that God wants you to have. And so we need to understand what it means to be poor in the spirit and then to be mourning. Number three is we need to have an attitude of being meek. Now, this word means, ultimately, that I need to have a mind for God. This word, meek, means that I need to have a mind for God. And then, ultimately, number four, means that I need to hunger and thirst for righteousness, knowing that we're building. I need to be poor in spirit. I need to mourn sin. I need to have a mind for God. And when I'm poor in spirit, and when I mourn sin, and I'm meek, then and only then will I hunger and thirst for righteousness. And no one will be able to keep me from the things of God. If there's something or someone that can keep you from the things of God, that something or someone has become an idol in your life. Now I'm not talking about if you're sick. I'm not talking about if you have an immune issue and you can't come to church because you do not and can't afford to become sick. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about the someone or the something that keeps you from worshiping God. It's become an idol in your life. And you need to be real cautious because you know what God does with an idol? God will remove the idol. And I do not want the people that I love to become an idol for me. I do not want the things that I enjoy to become an idol for me because one way or the other God has said even in the Old Testament laws in Exodus chapter 20 I will have no other gods before me do you believe the book and so if you're not hungry and thirsty for righteousness then you've entered into idolatry and you need to be real careful and friend let me say to you you may be so blinded by your idolatry that you can't see it but I can almost guarantee you, if you'd have a prayer meeting with your wife or your husband, they will point out your idolatry. If you had a prayer meeting with your children and you would ask them, what's mom's idols? What are dad's idols? They will point out your idolatry as pastors, as leaders. If we were to ask the people in our churches or the people that we work with, what is so-and-so's idol? They will point that out. And so please notice that then we move into this list. Poor in spirit, we're mourning, we're meek. We're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And number five, because we're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, we do not want to treat people the way that we've been treated. We want to treat people the way that God treated us. And except for Satan, and Satan had one choice, and the reason I believe Satan had one choice is because he was a created being. 
And unlike you and me, God made us and put us in the garden like he did Adam and Eve. We're prototypes, and our prototype, our model was Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve fell, so we know that all of us are going to fail. He made these angels that were created beings, and he made them to have a free will. He made them to have a mind. He didn't make them to be a robot, but he placed them in a place called heaven. They didn't have to come down here and go through the garden. They didn't have to come down here and go through the world. They didn't have to come down here and go through all the world because God use those to minister to him and to minister to us but Satan blew it and he got kicked out of heaven I don't know about you but I don't want to blow it with God and every time that I hear somebody say well I'd go to your church if it weren't filled with all of those hypocrites it reminds me that we're going to blow it I'm going to blow it you're going to blow it and the last time somebody said to me well I'd come down to your church if it weren't for all those hypocrites I said well come on down you'll fit in perfectly they didn't say that to me anymore. But they've not entered the doors. But I'm not here to judge them. Go ahead and say amen. amen. I need to have mercy. What's happened to the mercy of God? What's happened to the mercy of the world? And then number six is I need to be pure. Notice that I need to be pure in my heart. And this is the picture of Romans chapter 2 verse 29 that God will circumcise the heart. God is cutting that flesh. The Hebrews and Abraham and Isaac were circumcised as a sign of their covenant. The word covenant means to cut. We have a covenant of, with God today. Baptism is a picture of that covenant that we've experienced this morning. But ultimately, there's, that's the physical and the mental picture that we see. But the spiritual picture of the word covenanting means that He's cutting my heart. I no longer have to be like the Hebrews and be physically circumcised. But I have to have my heart cut and what he's doing is when he spiritually cuts and circumcises my heart, as in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, write that down and go back and look at it. You're, are, you're not a Jew outwardly, you're a Jew inwardly because your heart's been circumcised. He's cutting away the flesh. He's getting rid of the junk. It's kind of like when you go through your closet or you go through your house or you go through the church or you go through your workplace and you get rid of all the junk you do not need. If you don't get rid of it, God's liable to get rid of it. You need to clean house. And you need to allow the Lord to cut your heart. And so he's getting rid of all the spiritual junk. Especially the unconfessed, unrepented of sins. And then he goes on and he says, and you need to be a peacemaker. Ask yourself, do you cause people to gather? Or do you cause people to scatter? If you're a peacemaker, and this is a compound uh, Greek word, the word peace means irony. It was easy for me to memorize because it always caused me to memorize this and to think of God this way. He needs to reign in my life. And that's exactly what Satan, remember Satan told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree of knowledge, then your eyes will be opened and you'll be as God's and you can reign in your own life. That's our problem. Is we all want to be God, we all want to be God without God. We all want to be boss and we want no bosses. Even this week somebody said to me, well, you don't know what it's like to work in the secular world. You have no bosses. I have about 700 of them. They're called lifeliners. And I say that very humbly because I am here to serve you. I am here not to be served, but I am here to serve you. And thank God you serve Jesus Christ. And thank God God's made this church a house of prayer. And because of that, we can be peacemakers. And that's why we'll host a business and community leaders luncheon later in the week not because I ever want to be a politician I'm thankful for politicians and I'm thankful God didn't call me to be one and as a pastor I'm not a politician I'm not here to please people I'm here to please God and I have multiple bosses and I'm okay with that because I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life do you cause people to gather or do you cause people to scatter and then you're persecuted you're persecuted because you're like God and you're insulted, not because of your own sin, but because you're like God. And then ultimately, number 10, you rejoice. You rejoice. Hebrews 12, 2 says it this way. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand, of the throne of God. I can't imagine. 
tried to think. My mind cannot wrap around it. As Jesus carried his cross a little way up Golgotha's hill, God provided another young man to carry it the rest of the way. They'd already flogged him and beaten him beyond recognition. They said that you couldn't even tell what he looked like. When they got him on top of the hill, then they took off the rest of his clothes and they gambled for them. They spit upon him. They took literally a crown of thorns and pressed it down on his head so that the blood from his head and forehead came dripping down the rest of his blood, tainted, stained body. They hung him between two thieves. Both of those thieves mocked him, made jokes about who he was. If you're the son of God, he heard people say, get yourself off this cross. And then to be the God of all the ages, the God of the Hebrews, and then to be reminded that it was the Jew of the Jews that put him on the cross. He wasn't surprised by any of it. We shouldn't be surprised that the, the Romans, the populace, the people without God put him on the cross. But it was the people who had had a relationship with God that put him on the cross. Pilate said, I do not want this man's blood on my hands. And then Jesus uttered those words, Father, they know not what they do. Forgive them. Now, as much as I love my two children, if my children had beaten me beyond recognition, sped upon me, gambled over my clothes, stripped me naked, put a crown of thorns upon my head, could care less how long I hung on that cross, I don't know if I could say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And as we sit in these houses of worship on a Sunday morning, and we have the audacity to complain about what God may or may not be doing. The audacity to complain about what style of worship we like or what style of worship we don't like. And thank God, Clay, we don't have to deal with that. Or whether this is too loud or this is too soft or this is too much or this is too little. Or we don't have this or we don't have that. Who do we think that we are? Why is it that God's people cannot rejoice? Because we do not find ourselves with the attitude of Christ. Would you bow your heads with me please and close your eyes. Nobody's looking around. Would you rejoice today? Would you come today? I'm not asking you to even walk down an aisle. But would you come today, our pianist is going to begin to play, would you come today and say, Oh Lord God, in Jesus' name, let me rejoice. How do you rejoice? See Jesus, hear Jesus, and live for Jesus. Would you see Him today? Not only on that cross as he cried out, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. But would you see him? As he was raised from the dead and that tomb is empty. Would you hear him today? Would you let his Holy Spirit speak to you? If you have unconfessed, unrepented of sins, would you give them to him today? If you're a Christian and you're not living for Him, would you say, Oh, Lord, God calls me to repent and forgive me. I've not been living for you. Would you live for Him? See Him. Hear Him. Live for Him. Rejoice. Say, God, take full control of my attitude. 
God take full control of my attitude. Brother Josh and Miss Suzette are going to come and Levi. They're going to partner with me as we do our end time of invitation. We ask you to walk down an aisle because Jesus walked up a hill. Daniel Alderson's going to come. He's going to close us in prayer in just a few moments. So go ahead and make your way down, please. But I'm going to ask you today, if your attitude is not right, would you give that attitude to him? Ten things that we should have in our attitudes. Would you give your attitude to Jesus today? Would you rejoice? Would you see him, hear him, live for you? You need to be saved, then you come and ask Jesus to save you. You need to join this church by letter, by statement, by baptism, then you come and join this church. You're not here by accident. Your bottom's not in that pew because of an accident. God wants you here. We want you here. If God doesn't want you here, we don't want you here. But you come today and rejoice. Oh God, in these days, I pray that the light would be getting lighter. Those that see nothing but darkness, that they'd come to you with these ten characteristics of the attitude that we need to have for you. And God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd let us rejoice. Let us see you. Let us hear you. Let us live for you today. In Jesus' name. Stand together. If you need to come, you come. Brother Clay's going to lead us. You step out and you come today. Just as I am. Just as you are, you've come and rejoice. Take all of those other nine characteristics and ask God to apply them to you. Remember, God's invitation is never closed. Remember that if you're coming to the Business and Community Leaders Luncheon Tuesday, actor Judge Reinhold is going to be here. We need you to be here. We're going to be working on the Easter egg hunt. A lot of things going on, moving fast in our community. We need to be salt and light. Also, remember that Wednesday night we have church supper, so you be here for that. A lot of things going on this afternoon. Uh, all of our 5 o'clock activities, young adults meeting today, please have your young adults or somebody in that age group, 18 to 30 here, meet in the corner of the building, the young adult room, and have a great time. Remember that uh, to bring your candy-filled Easter eggs, you can pick those up, and you can see Miss Misty back in the back. You can pick those up in the uh, breezeway in the Welcome Center. It's good to be in God's house. Rejoice with me by saying hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Oh, good. Good stuff. Daniel, take that mic there, please, and close us in prayer. Let's pray together. Go ahead, Daniel. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us come in and gather in your name. We also thank you for everything that you've given us, given us, and we ask that you forgive us of our sins and help us repent from them. Ask that you watch over us as, as we drive home from church, and uh, we just ask that you be with us for the rest of our life, because in the end, we know we'll meet you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.